Alex, uh, thanks so much for coming. <laughs> it is great to be here. I so, just had to find the unmute button, but I'm here. All right. Well, you know, we're all learning. Um, <laughs> well, I have so many questions for you. Your, um, your, your book, uh, The Snow Leopard Project, um, is one of my all-time favorites. Um, I've been Thanks. such a big fan um, of all the work you guys are doing at Conservation X Labs. And, um, you know, the more I learn about you and the more I read, the more impressed and amazed I am uh, to hear some of these stories. So what's, um, you know, I start these interviews usually by asking what's a kind of a research topic for you that's, that's top of mind? What do you have your browsers open to? Yeah. Um, I mean, one, one is our, our mission is, um, is fundamentally ending, ending the sixth mass extinction. So we're always thinking about extinction and extinction is someone, I, something I've been passionate about since I was about eight or nine, when I found out that the passenger pigeon, a species that was so numerous that it literally would darken the sky for three days that we took that bird, that population from billions to, to zero. Mm -hmm. That is incredible to me. So I've always been thinking about like, well, what, what do we need to do? How do we actually need to understand extinction? How do we predict it? And in fact, my PhD looked at why do certain species survive after environmental change and others disappear and how to, what's the role of evolution in allowing for different degrees of plasticity. And I looked at that in lemurs. But right now, you know, we're thinking about this question of what are the solutions that could be the most transformative because conservation has fundamentally focused on, um, you know, arguing over what places we should protect, right? So it's species, it's hot spots, it's eco regions, it's landscapes or we're arguing over the endangeredness of a particular species, but no one is actually ranking and evaluating the solutions in terms of their impact, much like Project Drawdown did for climate change. And that's because it's actually a much harder problem. So this is one of the research areas that we have. The second is how do we actually generate more and better ideas through innovation, through a competition, through a series, both competition and collaboration within what we're trying to do. So those are kind of the, the big areas. What are the really big transformative solutions? Where is the best investment you could make for conservation? Uh, how do we, how do we um, improve the quality ideas that are out there uh, to be able to address conservation overall? Mm -hmm. you know, this morning I was reading about Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin and you know, it's one of those kind of stories that everyone takes, oh, it was a chance discovery. But if you actually read about Fleming, I mean, he wrote his um, medical school thesis on bacterial infections. He's, he dedicated his life to um, fighting them. You know, he, he, he was 20 years into that uh, when he made that chance discovery. And one of the things that I was taking away from that is, in order to solve big problems, you really have to almost fall in love with them in the sense that you're in like the, you're in for the, lo the long game with some of these big problems. And that's something I really um, admire about you is you are um, in the long, the long game with extinction, right? And fighting this problem. And you've taken that to the extremes. You've taken that to, you know, Madagascar to, to study lemurs. You've taken that, in, you know, post-war, uh, Afghanistan, and here you are on the kind of the edge of what's possible with emerging technologies. Um, but the the thing that's so cool about you is you've got this big picture in mind, but then you start drilling down into these problem areas and then into the potential solutions and technologies. Um, so you, you you hinted at this, but how do you prioritize, right? Like, you know, how do we create that drawdown? Where are you where are you putting um, your energy right now? Um, uh, you know, your question kind of works for me personally on two levels. One is, um, 
you know, a long time ago, I used to work on domestic conservation issues here in the United States. And then I asked myself, uh, you know, how do I maximize the number of species I predict, predict, uh, protect per unit minute of life? Hmm. And, um, and I said, well, I need to go to where the most species are, where, what it is the tropics, it is the coral reefs, right? If you're thinking about coral reefs, it's the coral triangle that has 50% of the world's fish, you know, in this region that is Southeast Asia, uh, captured by Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, um, you know, the Philippines, maybe um, Malaysia to the north, and Thailand. It is these places that we see the greatest opportunities to kind of protect the most things um, and the most species uh, that we have on the on the planet. Um, but it's interesting in terms of this question of prioritization. I think it's based on you know what what limits the extinction rate are the things we need to look at. We could look at individual species. We could look at total number of species. We don't actually know that, right? So my favorite example is the fact that when I left Madagascar um, uh, in 2001 at the end of my uh, two and a half years of living in a tent, you know, <laughs> days walker on nearest road chasing around lemurs, um, there were 45 known species of lemurs that were alive, that were ex uh, uh, extant. And then there were an additional 15 lemurs, all bigger than the current lemurs, like gorilla sized lemurs used to be in Madagascar that went extinct. There's now 114 species of lemurs, right? So in that 20 years, we have doubled the amount of primates, they're primates, right? On a country where 90% of the forest has already been cut. Hmm. So we don't even know what we are losing. The places I did my PhD, the system of fragments, many of those places, many of those forests just don't exist. Not just like a forest, but mid-altitude eastern, southeastern rainforests are just gone. And you know, Madagascar gave us a cure for um, uh, leukemia in children, children's leukemia uh, from the Malagasy periwinkle. It you know, the number of discoveries that people have done at the Cal Academies. Um, is extraordinary. They've done a ton of the work as, as have, you go into the forest and you will discover new things um, constantly. And so thinking about what allows us to bring down that rate, which we think right now is somewhere between a thousand and 10,000 times that of background extinction. And, um, you know, what reduces that rate overall uh, is what we need to, to be focused on. And what would give us the great, what are those biggest threats? What would alleviate some of those threats? And some of it is like, there's a number of different pathways and, and trying to figure out how, where we stop with those pathways is, is critical. So, you know, if you look at food, you know, food is not just the food, it's also the water, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the pesticides um, that we make place into the environment. Do you dread, you know, much of food goes into growing livestock, you know, do you replace that food by cellular agriculture, plant-based feeds, behavior change, or do you do it by addressing food waste, you know, which is, which is massive, you know, there's a trillion gallons of water in the United States just left on the farm field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many different angles and then being able to say, what would reduce the speed, you know, what would lead to the greatest amount of deforestation, and then what should we focus on? So Drawdown did this, and it's easier for for climate because you can look at it as CO2 emissions. You've got a really clear standard, and that's what we're trying to get to. But Drawdown did this, and you know, one of the most effective things they found was cooling technology. And so we, you know, we're running a competition of Rocky Mountain Institute and the Indian government to reinvent the air conditioning. Because like, uh, and in fact, they just ran through a um, test for 30 days of the finalists. And one of the companies is 10X, the best available technology you can buy on the market today, which, is, which means that if you scale that up, it is equal to the emissions of Australia and Finland. Like you don't need Paris, you have it literally through something that costs people less money 
and cost governments less money because you build your grid for the warmest day. Um, so thinking about and figuring out those solutions and how do you reduce that extinction rate, what would have the greatest impact is important. You have to be understanding what are the assumptions you have to make is critical, critical to those things. And can I, one of the things that really bothers me um, about extinction science is we have all these theories of biogeography, island biogeography or metapopulation dynamics. They all argue uh, that species actually should behave the same toward extinction, but they see the landscape the same way. But what is a boundary for one species may not be a boundary for another species. They may perceive the, the you know, their habitat in a completely different way. So I had some lemurs that would cross miles of rice paddies between these habitat fragments and what we were calling the mainland, which is really just a much bigger fragment, you know, when the moon was shining more brightly. And they would go through habitat you just imagine was completely inhospitable uh, in the course of a night and then come back to these fragments uh, again. While other species really couldn't ever leave the fragment, um, mm -hmm. had these percept. The other crazy thing is, you know, if you think about what all our data is from, we have assessed 5% of our biodiversity for species risk, and we tend to do it for animals that we like. And we tend to do it for, you know, so something, you know, we know much less about insects, so we don't have as much data about insects and, or, or worms or, or you know, fungi, there's just whole groups we just don't know anything about mm -hmm. um, that are probably essential to the ecological well-being and ecosystem integrity. Uh, but we, you know, for those species that we have studied, the very, we generally have studied them because they're easier to study. Mm -hmm. The very characteristics that make them easier to study, they range more widely, they might be eating more things, they, they're larger in body mass, are the very characteristics that actually make them more robust against extinction. So our data set for which we are, you know, we are estimating extinction rates completely biased by what we have just chosen to study in the past and the preferences that we as humans have had to be able to do that. So cutting through those things to look at that question of prioritization, not based on species, not even based on habitat, but what will save the most things in the most places in the, that 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 is kind of where we're focused and then how do we how do we replace those things mm -hmm. is kind of first and then second how do we, what's the best way to restore those habitats particularly given that evolution and ecology move forward not backwards mm -hmm. you know so those habitats forward looking you know look very different than habitats that are backwards looking and then you know what ways do we actually engineer resilience within systems um that we have that, uh, you know, to withstand the changes that we know will come no matter what we do on climate change. Even if we stop all cars, even if we go through what we went through in March again, yeah. uh, you know, we'll still see a lag effect for a long time on climate change. So thinking, thinking about where can we harness technology? And it means that, you know, we're now kind of more like gardeners or curators than we are of this idea that we've always had of Arcadia, of this perfect, pristine environment. Um, that if we alone, it'll go back to that. You know, we have, we, I don't think we're, the, we, we have that luxury. We've got to think about, we got to think about what does the, what do those environments look now toward the future? Yeah. So one of the things, so I, I got into, I don't, I actually don't have a background in science and technology. I got into this um, kind of accidentally with my friend Eric, we were building these robots in his garage and then, you know, figured out that all these people could use them and kind of got pulled into a lot of really interesting um, conservation projects, you know, whether that was monitoring coral reefs or, um, you know, you know, monitoring sewage outfalls or whatever it was. Like so many people were doing interesting things or, you know, looking at uh, the sea star wasting wasting yeah. disease. It was a, a whole host of things. And I suddenly got my, felt myself being pulled to the front lines of conservation, which I didn't realize were all around me. And so kind of a working theory that I have is that um, the prioritization uh, for these conservation challenges 
um, is really relative to where you are. And the best, the best case scenario for this conservation technology movement is it continues to become personal. Like, a, like people actually feel that they're engaged in this whole battle. And um, to that end, that's one of the, the, you know, I'm not affiliated with Conservation X Labs, but I kind of feel like I am. Like, I feel like you guys. <laughs> we feel that you are, and we, well, like, you know, you, you've said such nice things about me, but you literally were, are a North Star for a lot of the things and a lot of places we want to go and have wanted to go. Well, I hope people really understand that that was a real, it was kind of an accidental discovery on our part. <laughs> how close to these problems we actually were and how meaningful it ended up becoming for me personally. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I think that's available to so many people and they don't realize it, right? Like they think yeah, that, that, it's happening somewhere else. But, but what I wanted to say is I feel like I'm affiliated with you guys because you guys are championing that story and you're, and you're saying that, Everybody can be a part of that. You're creating that architecture for participation. So I, you know, you know, as much as we're talking about places, as much as we're talking about species, um, I also want to make sure that um, we talk about people because I know that's an important part of your 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 um, mission and message. Yeah, no, it is it is fundamental. I mean, it's a recognition that humans are in the middle of it. And one of the things we try to pretend as conservationists is, is to exclude humans. I remember when I was in Madagascar, I have a law background in addition to a uh, science background. Uh, and, um, you know, this person at, I'm not going to name the conservation group, was like, oh, awesome. We just declared a huge new national park and there's all these villages in it. You're a lawyer. How do we get rid of all the people? And I was just like, what a recipe for actually ensuring that your conservation efforts will, will, will not succeed hmm. by, by doing that, right? And um, what you want to do is empower people to manage their natural resources. You don't want this idea of neocolonial conservation. You want to actually incentivize people because those natural resources in the state that they're in actually improve their livelihoods, improve their well-being. And we've got this challenge that I've always sort of noticed that we ask those people who are closest to the problem uh, to fundamentally uh, bear the greatest cost for the protection after we built our economies by destroying natural resources elsewhere in the world. Uh, when in fact, we're, you know, we are the ones with the resources that are out there. In terms of conservation itself, it is, you know, Michael Sule, the founder of the Society of Conservation Biology or the godfather of it, at the very least, you know, passed away this year in 2020. And I think, um, you know, this idea of, he really coined this idea of conservation being a solutions oriented discipline. But at the same time, conservation was so closed, not just to people, it was really hard to get into it, uh, but even to other disciplines that are necessary for helping us solve these problems, right? Conservation in terms of the traditional conservation biologists that were in it, or even ecologists and evolutionary biologists like myself, really could help us to find the problems but didn't own the solution sets. And it took a much larger community for us to be able to do it. And the best thing we could do is actually inspire a whole new set of innovators and entrepreneurs to be able to actually not just address the symptoms of conservation, better monitoring of the environment, for instance, but actually address these underlying drivers and to wade into mainstream economies and be able to transform those economies that actually make them, you know, not drive species extinct, including ourselves, right? We're at this point where we may, you know, we are bringing about our own extinction. We may see a reversal of the gains that we've made on global health and food and economic growth around the world. And, and, and those, we will be hampered by what I call the degradation debt that we have started to accumulate and will soon need to, to, to kind of pay back. Um, so we need, we need a lot more people. We need a lot more solutions that have pathways to scale that can literally disrupt things that we know um, that are problematic. And that requires a lot of people in a lot of adjacent fields and a lot of adjacent thinking to come into the field and help us 
recreate who's a conservationist at the core. That, that I think you're right. I mean, and that's why we've always seen it as like a part of our effort has been, how do we actually build that community and empower that community? Um, whether or not like uh, it, it's a direct benefit to CXL, uh, it is a benefit to CXL that we, we are successful in doing that. And we always, we, we have an expression that we use that is like the dorkiest expression ever, but we're actually really serious about it. And it's this idea that extinction is our only competitor. Hmm. And so we remind us of that fact, we remind ourselves of that fact. Um, I, you know, I raise money for other organizations uh, that, that are, are in the conservation technology space because we all need to succeed mm -hmm. uh, for us to survive. I agree. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I could spend this whole hour talking about your book, The Snow Leopard Project. I think it was, you know, it was so good and it was such an, such a uh, story and such a, um, uh, I thought it was really compelling writing. Um, one of the things that I, I'd wanted to kind of ask you more about is this idea of taking action, even though the even though we're in the midst of such a traumatic and scary situation? And I think one of the interesting takeaways that I got from from the book, and actually wanted more of, would really really wanted you to talk more about this was um, the way that you uh, noticed the Afghani people who were involved in the conservation work really find meaning and purpose in it. And um, using that, um, you know, sense of agency, you know, figuring out what your agency is, in this case, the, the places and the species and the, um, you know, finding that kind of longer time horizon and holding on to that and building that and using that as a tool um, to get through traumatic situations because I think that's what we're all going through now. Um, like a really genuinely tough time. And I see uh, the, the story and the, the story that you're telling is one that's available to a lot more people than they realize and it's hopeful and it's meaningful. So can, can you talk more about that? Uh, I, you know, I think you did a better job than I did. And I really appreciate all the nice remarks uh, that you and my mom have made about the book. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, your reading of it doubled my readership, so I appreciate that. I still uh, tell people that I honestly feel like it's under it was under uh, underappreciated, and I the reason I think that is because I think you were busy starting a company and didn't have the time to give it the right promotion. So I still tell people about it, and I hope more people get to it because it was oh, it's awesome. I I I I appreciate that. Yeah, um, you know, it was it was something I started to notice was that the names of places in Afghanistan were named after wildlife that, you know, drawings and paintings inside people's houses were of wildlife that on, in restaurants, I saw wildlife, I saw, or, you know, decorations on their houses uh, were wildlife. And I also saw, I also learned because I didn't actually know until I, I really took on the, decided to take on this project, um, just how unique Afghanistan was. You know, this, we know that Afghanistan was a cultural silk road of people around the world of, um, you know, but I didn't realize that it was also this crossroads for wildlife from Africa, from, from Southeast Asia and from Europe, right? A place where you have grizzly bears, like brown bears and black bears and hyenas and primates and all, and snow leopards and tigers and cheetahs within a single country. That was extraordinary. So one, recognizing what was before me that people had this, um, this affinity for wildlife that was just naturally there. Uh, and particularly, for natural resources because 80% of the people at that time, it's now 70%, but 80% of the people were, were living in rural areas 
all USAID funds tend to, a lot of them went into the cities. And, you know, the majority of the funding of the development community actually came, comes back to the development countries. And then of that remaining, you know, 20% that actually stays in Afghanistan, so much of that is deployed in places like Kabul. By the time you get out to a countryside, they're getting one to two percent of the financial flows that have been invested in health. That's despite where most of the people are. But this argument of like, hey, if we actually protect the rangelands for a Marco Polo sheep, you it means that, or for an ibex, it means that that leopard, you know, snow leopard or Persian leopard now has prey and will no longer prey on your livestock or will decrease preying on your livestock. It means more people will visit, but it also means that, um, that that grass now sustains the livestock you need to get through the winter. And, and just people got that. Uh, I like to, I mean, I tell people that despite landmines and you know, IEDs and everything, in the country, it was the easiest place I had to do conservation. And something you know, about it was, uh, was powerful to people that we never had a problem with, with, with bribes. And pe when I tell the story about Afghanistan and what we did there, people are like, I tried to set up a project and we couldn't do it because the corruption was so bad. We never had that problem. And I think it was because we framed this, this, this exercise of what we were doing as this is how we restore your identity of which you know you have all the reasons in the world to be proud of of this incredible biodiversity that whose in exquisite nature re reflects the fierceness and resilience of the afghan people themselves mm -hmm. that to me um you know i was amazed there is a there's a car ride i did from Kabul to Bandamir, which became the first national park. And one of the things I was really proud of was in 2019, the 10th anniversary of that national park, you know, they had, they, they had 170,000 visitors, 95% of which were Afghans, which was proof that this was something that the people wanted. And it was something that was desired. There's national parks I've been to in Bolivia that have had 1,700 people in like 30 years visit that national park. Um, so this to me was like a great sign, but I remember being on this drive with, uh, and it was all Afghans and we're driving through the middle of the night and they were telling me these stories of how they survived during the last 30 years where, you know, um, them or their friends would be literally standing, you know, they would be standing on one part of a building, their family would be standing on the other side like in a room mm -hmm. and a missile or an rpg or a tank takes out that whole side of the building and they just happen to be two feet over where they're surviving or they were traveling down a road and they made a decision to turn left instead of right and the people who turned right all died and just how all these people despite you know these horrors of conflict of you know there are places where i dig into the road into the dirt and just find shell casings hmm. it was literally a new geological area era you know of uh, the bellow scene right this whole new era that was defined by warfare that these people went through that just the and you know for so much of the people who were refugees in iran where they were not respected because they were outsiders or in Pakistan where they were on the edge of illegality and misused or where they were in the UAE and the same deal or where they had to be a refugee going to Europe and risk their lives or try to come to the United States or Canada. That for these people who have come back, if we could restore the wildlife, I felt that we could help restore their identity and and we essentially spoke of it in that way, that this was, this is our chance to help rebuild things. And that's why we made the decision. Ben Amir was not the most biodiverse national park we could have chosen. The Wuhan, you know, this, this bit of land, this arm of land that represented the barrier between 
during the great game between the British and, and the Russian empires, right? And it's this incredible, uh, you know, stretch of the Western end of the Himalaya that, that is within this thing called the Pamir Knot. That's just a giant, you know, collision of Mount of the great mountain ranges uh, of the world. Uh, we chose this place that is spectacular for its own sake, in part because it was the closest in 1979 to becoming a park. It was, it was just on the cusp of that happening. And then the Soviets invaded. And we said, let's build that park and let's, let's allow life to continue again. Let's let's allow that normality to continue again. Let's allow the restoration of that identity. Let's make how the Afghans see, you know, let's make the Afghans proud of the incredible places that they have in their country. Um, and, you know, we were lucky enough to do that. You know, it's interesting because um, like the last five years, like I had some really dark, I mean, I don't want to go into all this stuff, but I had some really dark times from a, like an entrepreneurial perspective. It's a roller coaster. Um, but I also had some really hard personal things happen. And, um, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't talk about this very much, but one of the things that was, uh, like a cup, like a, something that I would always go back to was, um, for sanity was volunteering with this group called nature in the city in San Francisco. I don't know if you know the, this group, but it's this heroic volunteer organization that started from, a uh, the, really the insights from the amateur, from an amateur lepidopterist in San Francisco named uh, Liam O'Brien, um, who wanted to connect two like uh, populations of green hair streaks. Oh, that right, yes. Two green yes. Hair streaks. And so they created this green hair streak corridor and they're basically like digging up median, planting coast buckwheat, the, 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 yeah. the host plant, and, um, and created this um, like beautiful corridor throughout San Francisco in, um, the inner sunset. And, um, you know, you go out there on Saturday mornings and you do a volunteer, you, you're pulling up, you know, you're pulling up, uh, invasive plants and, and helping to plant and just maintenance. And it was the ultimate antidote to anything going wrong. In my own <laughs> it was great. And so I had, so I have like, you know, these, these real visceral, uh, personal, experiences that back up what you're saying it's not some kind of nice story that fits neatly in a book i've lived it i know it's true um so you know i i i hope that you and i can continue to kind of make the case you know from a, a bigger picture why this is important but i always i hope we remember to make the case from a personal perspective why this is going to be meaningful for folks to get involved okay and then so that's like all the the personal stuff but i want to zoom out because you just published a piece for the day one project um, which really is a bigger picture piece around some of the things that are possible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, this is day one project is essentially for saying, you know, what transition papers uh, as envisioned by people, particularly people in science for the Biden administration and thinking about what they need to do on day one in the first hundred days. And one of the things um, that happened to me there, this actually came out of a story was, was in 2009, I was working at State Department um, for the policy planning staff of, uh, of Secretary Rice. And, um, you know, we were responding to like SARS and avian influenza, and we were spending billions of dollars in that response. And I said, you know, and we had, you know, there were other examples uh, at that time of, um, emerging pandemics that were coming out because of this intersection between conservation, wildlife, and domestic animals and humans that dealt with deforestation and wildlife trade and, and other factors. And I said, you know, instead of spending what was at the time $9 billion, a drop in the bucket now, responding to a single emerging infectious disease, why don't we start thinking uh, in a reactive way, right? Why don't we start thinking about the upstream factors that gave rise to these diseases in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and start thinking about how do we prevent the spillover 
of these events from happening. And then in particular, where can conservation um, actually play a role uh, as this idea of pandemic parks, of reducing wildlife trade, of actually transforming uh, food systems, of thinking about the role that climate change can play. And, you know, there was a great science paper done by Andy Dobson at Princeton University with a number of other co-authors on it that showed, look, you know, this is going to, this pandemic is going to cost us 15 to 20 trillion dollars uh, and maybe more because we're in another wave by the end of it. But, you know, if we invested in such upstream factors, um, you know, we could, we, you know, with, with $20 billion, we could actually greatly reduce the chance of these pandemics from spilling over in the future. And that conservation plays a key role. And, and so this was an update of that 2009 paper. The, and 2009, the reaction was, this will never happen. Mm. Uh, and I actually sent the paper in March back to the guy, or it was actually in June, back to the guy that said, this will never happen, just because he was the head of policy planning at the time to say, um, actually, it did. And you had a chance to stop it, and you chose not to. And so this was, what do we need to do as an organization, as a, as a country, to make these types of investments domestically and abroad around wildlife trade, around wildlife trafficking and the pet trade, around deforestation, uh, around bushmeat, around climate change, uh, to be able to reduce the chances of these spillovers. And one, one example of that, for instance, is, you know, USAID is the world's biggest bilateral development agency. I used to be the chief scientist of it. Um, and created its DARPA for development. But like we do all these things, we have a stance, at least we did under Obama, you know, around climate change, around biodiversity, but we don't actually know um, if we aren't through other actions undermining climate change at the same time we're trying to, you know, reduce emissions around climate change or increase our resilience to climate change. Um, and the same thing's true of biodiversity. So one of the things, for instance, we call out for is let's actually have USA declared the first climate neutral and biodiversity neutral or extinction neutral development agency in the world. And let's actually measure that uh, in the agency and look across the portfolio of our activities, not our operations, but our investments, $20 billion a year, mm -hmm. right? To say, you know, what could, can we make sure that on average across what we are doing, we are not making the problem worse. We're actually investing in helping other countries create new pathways to industrialization. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely include a link. I thought it was a great um, paper and I hope people, I hope if we've learned, any, I hope we learned something from, from this moment and I would love to see, I would love to see conservation be the lesson. So, um, do you, do you mind if we go to the research mode? I'd, I'd love to see if you have anything to share and, uh, um, you know, what, how you actually do research because it, it, it amazes me. So should have permissions. Yeah, I, I don't, I didn't have a lot, uh, prepared on, <laughs> on, on that. Um, but it is, it is, uh, it is, you know, frequently it is going deep into the scientific literature, deep into the gray literature, um, but then it's actually pulling together the people once we get to what we think are the frontier questions uh, of science and technology and actually seeing, um, seeing, you know, what they, what they think. How, how do we make this, how do we actually argue together about where we should make those types of investments so uh, around what we're doing. Okay, so interesting. So you so the so the destination on the map is the frontier questions, if I'm hearing that. And and the way yeah. to get to the frontier questions is first cut through some of the the literature, the scientific literature, and then and then get the people together. So some kind of convening. Because yeah, right? you've got you've got this problem in science. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> I mean, I, I think you discussed this on your show of some of the challenges of science is yeah. that, 
you know, each discipline has its found, its fads, its constraints, its boundaries, its walls, right? right? It, its own value systems even. Um, so one example is the Society of Conservation Biology. So when I was chief scientist at USAID, it was very interesting because I was working on these really disparate fields. I was working on global health, I was working on food security, I was working on energy, I was working on environment, I was working on education. They all have their own communities, mm -hmm. right? But to actually solve any one of these problems required bringing these communities in novel ways together because we recognize that your malnutrition actually reduces educational outcomes. It literally reduces the ability of people being able to, to retain what they learned over the course of the day. It also reduces your ability to uptake uh, vaccines and your immune response to uh, those vaccines that are out there. So you can't just look at it in terms of vaccines. Conservation had you know, huge limitations in how it was solving things because it was looking at what are the better ways of building a national park? How do we actually figure out how we maximize species? About thinking about the pressures on those systems. But the other way was um, in global health, we've recognized that, um, that uh, there is this whole field called implementation science. So it's not enough to just build the vaccine. We're seeing this now mm -hmm. with COVID. It is how you make sure that the vaccine will be actually distributed, the cold change that it's going to require. And then actually the, 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 the behavior change of getting people to actually take the vaccines. And I just heard something on NPR that suggested 58, only 58% 58 of Americans were willing to take the COVID vaccine, you know, which will greatly affect its effectiveness at getting rid of COVID-19 uh, around what we're doing. Well, in conservation, we have the same thing. We will design, uh, we will come up with ideas of what is the perfect way to actually do conservation but very little time is actually spent in terms of how do you actually get communities to accept those ideas? How do you make those effective parks? What are the tools and structures that we need to ensure that conservation is effectively maintained? How do you make sure that your parks don't get de-gazetted? You know, how do you actually do um, and support economic outcomes for people around the national parks? Uh, as a result of what you're doing? How do you work and tie their identity to protecting the national park? How do you set up the governance structures? We spend very little time on that implementation science. And when I would talk about, I was on the board of governors for the Society of Conservation Biology, and I would talk about implementation science, there would be this pushback that that wasn't something that we did. Hmm. And But even though this field of global health, that in some ways I felt 20 years was ahead of conservation had you know found its breakthrough by actually digging you know doubling down on that idea of implementation science so one of the hardest challenges we have is not only just understanding where the frontiers are within a particular field and the particular issues and who are the people working on it but then how do you actually how do you bring these fields together to then evaluate what is the solution we need to address, where is that solution founded, particularly when you have different value systems, different, term, different language, different terms of art, even um, different approaches to how you do science and what is acceptable. And that's the part that, that you know, we also need to kind of figure out uh, within the piece of, of what we're trying to do. On the science of innovation, you know, which is work that we've been doing. We just had um, a student, uh, Felicia Nick, uh, defend her PhD yesterday at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and it was based on the Conservation X Tech Prize and, and as well as one of our grand challenges. And where we were looking at, you know, could you actually, um, what are the ways of improving so you have more and better ideas? Mm -hmm. And one of the, um, what, you know, one of the, things we, we realized is that if you just run the competitions by themselves, a lot of the ideas aren't very good and a lot of the effort is wasted. That in fact, um, when you run a prize or a challenge, and we do a lot of those, and I built the grand challenges for development program at AID, my co-founder Paul Bungie, 
you know, ran, was chief scientist at XPRIZE, ran a lot of prizes, right? You got this problem that you got a few winners or a single winner and you have all these losers, but these losers may all have bits of the solution that might be actually much more powerful than, than you know, the winning idea within that competition. So how do you actually bring them back in? How do you incentivize, um, you know, peer feedback? How does that actually work? What is the role of X, you know? And so we start doing all these experiments. Um, if you provide peer feedback late, people's ideas go to fixation, it doesn't work. If you actually allow for, uh, you know, the match of their expertise, whether uh, if it's random versus if it's similar versus if it's overlapping matters in terms of how much of that feedback is actually taken up by what they're doing. If you have experts, experts are much less willing to take feedback. Um, it, I don't know if that's because of identity issues around their fixation on certain ideas, and this gets to you know, Peter Diamandis's act that if you want to know exactly how not to do something, just ask an expert. Um, because they're, you know, they're not the ones that are going to be responsible for, for the breakthroughs, but they actually provide really good feedback to others. So the question is, what gets you toward where you're trying to go? What types of innovations will lead? Is it better where you have the average level of the ideas increase, or do you want that single outlier? These are all the questions that we're doing. And a lot of this is laid out in the literature, um, which we read, but then it's been running, you know, we've been trying to run these experimentations and running permutations in these experiments to get at an answer as to what ways can we actually structure these competitions through collaboration uh, to be able to do better. And on the artisanal scale mining, we ran an experiment where part of the idea was uh, being able to um, uh, actually requiring everyone to provide a certain amount of feedback, but actually having them evaluated for their feedback that goes into their overall score, so people are incentivized, but also giving people a chance to win part of the the outcomes uh, if the person if the team you're providing feedback to is successful. So people were incentivized in many ways to actually much more likely to share ideas and help those ideas go forward. And because the end goal was not to find a winner, the end goal was to actually figure out how we, the best way to solve a fundamental problem. Mm. So let me just play that back. So what I'm hearing from you is you're arguing for a more porous boundary around scientific disciplines because it's those intersections and those edges where new ideas both get in and also affect and impact the real world and yeah. then yeah go on and then recognizing that fact how do we improve the process to support that instead of having these systems that are you know winner take all which keep funneling things you know towards the center how do we move support and um development collaboration and attention out to those important intersections. And I like that you, um, that you guys have come to that conclusion. You know, it's interesting because prizes have grown in popularity. And um, I've done a lot of reading on, there's actually not a lot of literature yet on how effective they are or anything. And it, we're still at the beginning of them. And I was talking to Tom Khalil recently about the, the different um, things that like you could invest in as a, as a science program officer. Like what are all the assets we could invest in? You know, expensive big tools like the Hubble telescope or low cost tools or, you know, peer reviewed papers or peer reviewed. Um, and there's a, there's a consistent theme that's been going on since, you know, for the last 70, 80 years, which is the system is, tr is trending more and more towards kind of a winner takes all where, you know, the peer review is, is, um, you know, tr you know, the scientists are picking the people they know and the ideas that are safe. And uh, even the prizes right now, we see this trend towards, um, you know, there's one big winner, just like you said. One of the things we're doing at Experiment that I'm excited to tell you about, but also, you know, see how it plays out is we're doing proportional um, prizes. So we're everyone who's qualified, who like the bar, we're excited about, we want to encourage them. And so we disperse the prize um, based on the number of um, other people that they're able to get engaged and excited. So we're trying, we're, we're experimenting with um, other ideas, but 
one of the things that I'm finding is it's such a like a blue ocean out here in terms of alternate models, right? And yeah. that's why it's so cool to hear that you guys are are um, innovating on that in that kind of space because it's so needed, right? Like the goal here is how do we get more people working on these problems? And in order to do that, we got to fix the system. There's there's an incredible. I mean, this is the one of the amazing things is we've seen this mass democratization of opportunity because of communication, because of technology, the just, you know, the availability of tools that were, impo- as you very well know, things like SynBio that were just, and digital biology that were just out of anyone's grasp before. Um, the ability of being able to, you know, uh, develop, you know, apps, the ability to develop electronics, the, the unbelievably low cost of the sensors that we have available to us. Um, a lot the things like 3D printing that allow for iterative prototyping have given us um, incredible opportunities for more people to be involved in more places. And I think that there's also, you know, a movement, uh, science, like the number of names on a paper have actually increased because the questions that we're asking require more people and more perspectives to be able to ask them. Um, and you're totally right. I mean, there is a conservancy that's really hard that we're trying to figure out, you know, in, in um, how do we not allow expertise to get rid of actually the truly breakthrough ideas that are out there? How do we allow for experimentation um, that, uh, you know, that isn't happening right now? And, you know, a lot of my views on risk have been just this observation that the riskiest path maybe continuing what we're doing today right but people generally see risk as any change Mm. but we you know on extinction we know the cost of that path that we're on today and it is so high that why wouldn't be trying to experiment and try to do other things why do we continue to double down on the existing ideas of national parks uh, which, which there's nothing wrong i love national parks i've built national parks around the world but we also need to relieve the pressure off those parks you know by creating these replacement technologies around what we're trying to do but you know science and science and other fields are con- inherently conservative the joke when i was a grad student at University of Chicago was that for an NIH grant, you had to have 80% of the experiments completed and done before you submitted the grant, you know? And it was just like, that was what, like, that was the only thing that would allow that grant to, to be able to go forward in terms of, of what you're trying to do. And I think, uh, I think that there's, um, you know, finding new ways of funding finding new ways of actually allowing people to work together on science. One of my other favorites um, is, was something that was done that was called open source drug discovery. That was actually uh, a huge inspiration for a lot of our work, right? Which was recognizing, you know, it, it, you know, it was, I think it was uh, individuals in India recognizing that people, you know, pharma was not paying attention to things, uh, to certain types of drugs. And one of which was, I think there was a TB drug that um, was too bitter. And if you have that drug being too bitter, people were less likely to take it. And if they were less likely to take the full regimen of the drug, you were gonna get extremely drug resistant TB, which is arising around the world. And you, you um, which is, you know, then you have no choices to this really terrible, uh, terrible disease. Um, and so they recognize that if you could change the molecule from right-handed to left-handed uh, in this drug, uh, for this drug, you could actually reduce the bitterness of it and improve the uptake. Hmm. But none of the pharma companies were incentivized because it wasn't for them a big enough market to be able to do so. So they created an open source platform called um, Open Source Drug Discovery, where the design of the experiments were done on the platform. The experiments were done in open lab notebooks. The, they were done in a distributed manner. Uh, people report the results um, out 
on the platform. I think the papers were written up in a wiki uh, collectively and analyzed in a wiki. And then the license was then uh, free for people to then be able to develop these drugs. And what was extraordinary was thousands of scientists from over a hundred countries uh, and a huge percentage of which came from pharma, which is so closed and so, you know, uh, to participate in this. And you know, they were able to, 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 to accomplish these goals. Um, that's to me suggested there are more models out there that we should be looking at of collaboration rather than competition of open approaches, which you, you know, you're a pioneer of, of being able to actually provide value for people. Um, I mean, there's a question, this idea of pers making it personal, mm -hmm. right? Of digging up, di you know, creating the corridors as you were doing on the medians. Well, for pharma, that's what these individual scientists that were in pharma whose day jobs may not be one that gives them as much benefit as doing something good because mm -hmm. it is something that would help a lot of people and address a really important problem. This question of identity is not just important for the Afghans, it's important for everybody, mm -hmm. right? Because it's how it is, you know, just telling people it's the right thing to do to recycle or whatever itself is not always persuasive. But, you know, even images of the panda bear, sorry, the panda bear, the polar bear on the ice floe, right? floating out slowly to see, right, is does not actually encourage people to solve the climate crisis, but allowing people to participate and change how they see themselves is an unbelievable, powerful tool to give people the opportunity to be able to do that. So you're right. You're here. So, um, you know, those all really qualify for good ideas to make science better, which is what I'm trying to, to capture. So I appreciate that. Um, Alex, thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to continuing to follow along. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is super fun. All right. Take care.